Good evening, everyone, and good morning to Nancy and Eric. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you for this episode of The Universe Rights, wherein we get notable international writers to speak to all of you one-to-one -one and exchange views on storytelling on what their writing trajectory has been like. The, right, uh, the Universe Rights is presented by Sri Simens and in association with Prabhaketan Foundation and Siahi. And today we have, uh, and I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with um, the Enola Holmes uh, series because all of us have binged on Netflix since the pandemic broke out last year. And it was a stunning narrative. The, the storyline, the plotting, the characterizations, everything, uh, whether you've read the series or you watched it um, on a visual medium, either or, I can, I'm, I'm a literary agent, so I'll always say the book was better. The books were better. Um, I'm one of those purists and, um, and an old fashioned person, I guess I'll always have more faith in the printed word or you read it digitally. But today we are welcoming Nancy Springer, who has been a lifelong professional fiction writer. Is that how she defines herself? And she just told me that she is on her 59th book. So as our audiences, you all are in for a veritable treat with sparkling conversation with Nancy, whose genres have gone, have traveled from mythic fantasy to contemporary fiction, to magic realism, mystery, and, um, Enola Holmes, as you know, are short novels about Sherlock Holmes' younger sister, Enola. And um, we also have her coming out with more and more books in the future. Like she just said, she's, she's tried, but she's losing track of which editions happening in which country, which is great. More success to you, Nancy. And in capable hands today is the entire session. We have a fantastic moderator with us uh, in Eric Lindstrom, who is a BAFTA and WGA nominated veteran of the interactive entertainment industry. He also writes young adult fiction and his debut novel, Not If I See You First, came out in 2015, won a lot of acclaim, and he's working, as he says, on his third novel. I'm going to leave it to the two of you to carry the session forward. Thank you so much, Nancy and Eric, for joining us. Over to you. Well, great. Thank you so much for having us. And I'm very excited to be able to talk to you today, Nancy, because I have to say that when I first read The Case of the Missing Marquess, your first Enola Holmes novel, I was really excited because I had been, I had this book recommended to me because it had such intricate character and plotting. And I was very trepidatious because I love Sherlock Holmes and so much media gets Sherlock Holmes wrong. But very quickly reading that book, I found that the voice, the setting, the character, everything was just, it was just perfect. And the way that you delivered that whole venue with a young adult audience in mind, I thought it was just brilliant. Well, well thank you. I, I don't have any excuse at all for being perfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you don't need any. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, I have got to read your coming out, your next book's about to come out, Enola Holmes and the Black Barouche. And uh, it's as wonderful as all the rest. I loved it. So uh, what I wanted to start with was uh, you've described yourself as someone who didn't realize you were writing mysteries when you first started. So when you first thought of the idea of writing about Sherlock Holmes having a 14-year-old sister, once you had the basic idea of that as a character, because you like to explore character more than plot as your starting point, what were the elements of her as a character in her world that she navigates did you start with that you wanted to explore? Well, uh, I've got a stupid 
voice problem right now because it is morning. But uh, I didn't want her solving murders. I did not want to go into the dead body part of things at all. Uh, Enola as a character, she does not define herself as a detective. She defines herself as a purgatorian, which I must admit is a made up word, but there was a name they gave to Victorian women, Perdita, which means the lost one. So there's a Latin root, I guess it's a Latin root, maybe a Greek root in there somewhere. Oh, perdition, of course, go to perdition. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's where you are lost. And she is a finder of things that are lost. She's an explorer. She likes to hunt, to uh, look into nooks and crannies. She, uh, yeah, I mean, literally as a child, she uh, climbed trees and looked into birds' nests. She, uh, she sought out the little secrets in, uh, in her, her natural setting. And in that she's very much like I am. I was kind of a, a free range child. I was born in 1948 to a pair of parents who were 40 years old at the time. And uh, they pretty much believed in feeding children, uh, providing them with clothing and letting them explore. And Enola, uh, Enola's distant mother is modeled after my own uh, loving but distant mother. Uh, I'm curious about that. Um... The relationship she has with her mother, such as it is, because in the stories, it's somewhat at a distance. Um, what did you think of in terms of how that relationship, not just with respect to your own history, but in the framework of the novel, can you describe how that relationship related to Enola's journey? There's a sense of abandonment and in the end, of course, we find out that her mother abandoned her for a, a good reason, or at least what appeared to her to be a good reason. But uh, that this whole thing is so, so connected to my own lifetime experience of what it's like to have a mother, what it's like to have a mother who kind of goes off and leaves you. Uh, and uh, how it is to find yourself and to work within that, uh, that parameter of uh, mom loves me, but uh, she's not here. She doesn't have my back. Mm -hmm. um, so Enola is very much psychologically me. <laughs> is that something you find you do a lot in your writing or just in certain novels? Uh, yeah, I do it a lot, uh, but uh, the first 10 or 12 or maybe 15 books I wrote were fantasy and they were based on uh, male princes who, uh, who were good buddies, always, always two heroes to a book. And it took me a long time to figure out that First of all, I was identifying with the males. And second of all, that I was, uh, it, both of them were me, that it was me coming, coming to grips with my forbidden side. I had a public side. I was raised to have a public side and a nobody talks about it side. And uh, so I discovered myself in those fantasy novels and then I just free ranged. I, I decided to turn my vision outward. Uh, very often, I would write a novel that was based on something that had upset me, uh, on a terrible accident or a terrible uh, act of aggression within my community that had uh, that had taken place. Um, coming back, <clears throat> excuse me. So it was actually a surprise. I didn't realize until after I had written Enola and sent her off the first book and felt such butterflies. I, then I realized that, oh boy, I was at it again. I was writing about myself. <laughs> I'd like to get into that a bit more, but let's uh, stick with Enola for a moment. Uh, 
especially in those early novels, um, would you talk about the language of flowers and the way that you carved out a space for Enola to let her shine and excel without being in the shadow of Sherlock Holmes, who was the ultimate sleuth who knew everything? Yeah, well, Sherlock Holmes knew everything about men mm -hmm. and very, very little about women. And I read Sherlock Holmes when I was a child and I absolutely adored him. I still do absolutely adore him. And I remain in awe and mystification about how he has turned into such a predominant character in literature to the extent that a fair number of people treat him as a, as a historical personage. They, uh, they, they set up a house for him on Baker Street and so forth. Um, but uh, given that Sherlock Holmes was about men, it was not difficult to say, okay, Enola's going to be about women and what do women in this era of history do? They communicate secretly. They are dominated by a patriarchy. They communicate by uh, secret codes and they did. They had a language of flowers, a language of sealing waxes, a language of gloves, a language of handkerchiefs, a language of postage stamps, a language of fans. How you held your fan was immensely uh, communicative. And because Sherlock had never attempted to woo a wife, I knew that he was ignorant of all of this. If he had been a young courtier, he would have learned the language of flowers and he would have learned the language of fans. If I tap my cheek, that means you're allowed to speak to me, that sort of thing. But he didn't and he wasn't. And uh, that was his great, uh, that was my opening. Very, very good. I am, um, I'm a big fan of uh, what you've done in your books and in other great books where they don't talk down to the young audience, especially with reuse of vocabulary and themes. Uh, but I'm also very interested in how you reconciled what I think is the, the, the more difficult problem, which is the way people thought the mindset back in Victorian England is different in many ways than it is to modern people, modern readers, and how you balanced the way people thought back then with the way people think now and how you managed to walk that line where you made the story authentic, but at the same time, didn't write it exactly the way it would have been written back then, if you, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I think I do. Um, I've always been, well, one of the most basic things about writing for children and young adults is that you have to be on their side that you are a, a young adult's advocate, that you understand their position of being uh, under the thumb of adults, under the thumb of authority and in rebellion and uh, in, uh, in resistance, so to speak. Uh, and the problem of the psychology it, it was really just a matter of translation where, where we would say cognitive dissonance, for instance, which is a Freudian term, uh, I would have to think what they would say instead, like what a pickle or all messed up. Um, it, it was uh, mostly a matter of using the old fashioned language. Uh, Enola's innocence came very easily to me because I was raised as an innocent. I was in my 40s before I realized that most of my friends were gay. I <laughs> simply was not part of my upbringing. Uh, I was well along into adulthood before I realized uh, what it was for married people to have affairs. It's, it simply was not admitted into my childhood. My, I asked my mother what things were and she said, oh, they're bad, that's bad. And, and then there was, there was no further elucidation. So when 
Enola makes her own observations, for instance, that women retreat and then appear with a child and then retreat and then appear with another child and then retreat and then appear with yet another child until they have too many children or else they die or else they desist. Um, that was the situation that I was in through most of my childhood and early adulthood, just trying to figure out how things work. She speaks of uh, dens of iniquity because she has heard uh, Watson, and in, in, my, in my case, it's always Watson, it's never Conan Doyle, it's always Watson who's writing, and uh, because I'm in the fictional world. And Watson speaks of dens of iniquity, and she thinks, oh, dens of iniquity, but she has no idea what they are. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was curious to, to hear about was, especially in the early books, because like, like you mentioned, Anola actually evolves quite a bit over the course of the series. But in the early books, she has this strong focus to finding lost people, but she also has this major underlying problem and fear of, of losing her autonomy, her freedom. Uh, can you talk about the tension between those and the importance of that, uh, that theme? Well, it was a horrifying situation in the Victorian era because women really uh, were expected to be chattel. They were expected to submit the word obey was very much part of the marriage rights. Um, and women were, I've, I've been reading lately fiction that's set in the 1930s, 1940s, and even then it's like, oh, my husband told me to do this, so I must. Or my father told me to do that, so I, I must. I have no choice in the matter. And, and to me, it's, it's simply terrible. Uh, the extent to which uh, women's freedom was impinged and the extent to which not only women, but young people had no rights whatsoever at all. Young Victorian people typically, especially in the lower classes, they typically worked and earned a living from the age of say six. Uh, they were working in the, in the factories, the uh, the, the, the uh, linen factories, the cotton factories, uh, the mines, they were working as chimney sweeps, whatever. And they were doing a, a full grown person's job. They were working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And yet they had no rights whatsoever. No right to vote, no right to speak for themselves, no right to complain, uh, no recourse if they were ill treated. So it was a, a, a dreadfully severe situation back then. Uh, to this day, I still viciously defend my own rights to uh, speak my mind and so forth. We still have uh, some problems in that direction, but not even remotely comparable to what the situation was in the 19th century. Definitely true. Let's pull back a little bit because uh, you've written a lot of books, 59 books. That's, that's mind boggling to me. <laughs> that, is a, that is a lot of typing. And, and I actually want to touch on that a, a, again a bit, a bit later, but first, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes's world, but also Robin Hood's world and Short Forest and King Arthur mythology. Uh, you've written in, in all these worlds. I'm curious what, what draws you to pre-existing uh, worlds? Not well, just your own. That, that actually happened rather late in my career. I was very much uh, writing my own fantasy worlds and then writing my own books, my, my single books, Sink or Swim, you know, here's my book. Uh, and most often they sank rather than swam. Uh, when I joined on with JVNLA, the, the Jean, Jean V. Nagar Literary Agency, Jean, I, uh, that was back in the era of Jean, suggested that I should start to use what she called classic chassis. In other words, uh, to base my books on 
a mythos that was already there to give readers a better entree into, uh, into my worlds. Um, my worlds, when I was making my own worlds, they were pretty hard to figure out. <laughs> so, and I, I was pretty challenging to be read. So uh, by doing the, the King Arthur books first, and that again, it was uh, Jean Nagar's idea, but it was also the idea of an editor who courted me to write about Mordred, and then who suggested that I write about Morgan Le Fay. And it worked, and I was like, dang it, why, why, why don't people pay this much attention to my worlds? <laughs> but uh, then I'm proud to say that I came up with Rowan Hood, Robin Hood's daughter, all by myself. Very nice. And then so as, far as, as far as Enola was concerned, that self-same editor asked me to write something set in deepest, darkest London at the time of Jack the Ripper. He did not specify Sherlock Holmes. So in a sense, I came up with that myself under pressure. <laughs> Very nice. So back when you were writing in your own fantasy worlds, uh, in terms of your journey as a writer, uh, why did you start there? I was loaded up to the brim and beyond with daydreams about these uh, martyred heroes undergoing dreadful uh, trauma. And I simply needed to offload them. At the time, I was not aware that I myself was undergoing dreadful trauma and that I needed to resolve it. Uh, I, was, I was raised in a very Victorian household where most rules were tacit, unspoken, and most emotions were unspoken and unacknowledged. So I did not actually understand that I was an angry person until I was in my 30s. I did not know the name of that emotion that made me shake. I did not know the names of most of my emotions. And it was through uh, counseling, but also through the book writing process that I gradually started to understand, oh, there's more than one side to me. Th this, this nice person, she's also got a nasty person. I, I, I started to get in touch with my inner bitch. Nice. So you're not just talking about writing as catharsis, it's, it's writing as self-discovery. Yes, it very, it very much was my therapy, a very effective therapy. And it took me, I guess, 10 to 15 years before I started saying or thinking, um, okay, I'm tired of looking inwards. I think I've got it now. How's about, I, I like writing now. At, at first it was just writing was necessary. Writing was my out. It was the only place I had to go with all this mess. But after I had written that many books, and by, by, by the way, Eric, what, I really was typing them at first. Uh, yeah. triplic, on an old fashioned typewriter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, <I> uh, remember. <laughs> after, after I'd written that many books, uh, I had learned how to be a writer and I loved it. And I started applying it uh, more ambitiously. I thought I'd try writing this and I'd try writing that. And my well-meaning agent at one point, uh, my previous agent before uh, the JVNLA, suggested that I should stick to one genre if I was going to make a success of myself. And of course I couldn't, I had to explore. So which came first? Did you learn something about yourself and your world and then write about it? Or did the process of letting all this out and writing about something reveal something about yourself? Which, which drove the other? The writing came first. Um, I graduated from college, discovered that I was sublimely bored. I was already married. My, my husband considered that it was his job to support me. I was lying in bed until noon, 
with these endless daydreams going on in my head. And eventually I just felt like I needed to offload them. I had a great deal, excuse me, well, I, I should have grabbed a bunch of cloth drops is what I should have done. Didn't think of that. <clears throat> Golly. Anyhow, uh, I had a great deal of trouble getting started as a writer because I was born just a little bit too soon and all the writers I had studied in college as an English lit major, they were all male, except for Jane Austen. And she was writing romance, which was not my intention. I was already married and had kind of soured on romance by that time. And uh, so I just fished around until I decided if I could put these crazy, weird adventures going on in my mind into a fantasy world, maybe I could get away with them. That's how I started writing fantasy, which proved to require every bit as much research as anything else, because in order to write fantasy, you have to be familiar with psychology and mythology and Jung and Freud and Campbell and a whole lot of other, and, and uh, in my case, Celtic mythology and a great deal of background material. But fantasy in that sense, especially the high fantasy, I mean, there's a lot more to it in terms of the magic, the mythical creatures and whatnot. So your daydreams weren't just apparently fantasizing about beating up the school bully. There was, there was more to it. Your, your daydreams sounded like they had a more elaborate embroidery to it than simply contemporary fantasizing, right? So I'm wondering if those daydreams that fueled your writing, did you have a lot of them to a superficial depth or did you have a few that got really deep and complex? How did you live this inner life that fed the writing later? It, it really was mostly about beating up the school bully. And <laughs> <laughs> the first book I wrote, uh, I set it in a fantasy world but I did not get into the supernatural much at all. Mm. I simply wanted a place where I could beat up bullies and <laughs> freely with swords and so forth. So, forth. so uh, as it came to publication, the editor suggested more of a uh, mythic take on it. And the very first book that was released was called The Book of Sons. It was published in 1977, it was published as general fiction. It did reasonably well. Uh, it was sort of half-assed fantasy. It was uh, trying to render it more what the editors wanted had introduced me to the mythology. And also I had forever been in love with the poetry of William Butler Yeats and had been researching the background to the poetry. But uh, it was editorial pressure that got the fantasy elements in there. And that first book was rewritten and completely re-released as uh, The Silver Sun and was very successful in that form. But no, the, the adventure and the school bully came first and the fantasy came later. So after writing fantasy, you said that you couldn't stick to a, a genre when you left fantasy, or I shouldn't say left fantasy, when you jumped into writing books that weren't fantasy, what, what triggered that? Well, it was just, uh, the fantasy was all about me, myself, and I. And all those people were fighting it out, you know, the, the forbidden me and the nice me and the not so nice me and all the rest of it. We're fighting it out on this imaginary landscape, which was very suitable for sword play and horseback riding. And uh, I simply began to feel that this was not where I wanted to spend my entire life. But uh, of course, the, the mark, okay, uh, I guess I ought to say that I was earning a living as a writer, kind of by accident, but that ended up being what happened. Uh, by the time I had written a few books, I was making more money than I could make in any other way. I was supporting my then husband, my children, my horse, and one third of my mother. So writing was serious business and my editors still wanted 
fantasy. So I kind of sidestepped into contemporary fantasy, magical realism. And I did a number of books uh, from contemporary women's point of view that turned out to be many of them hilariously funny because if you uh, impinge, say, the frog prince upon a normal middle-aged woman on her way to the mall, it becomes hilarious. And the normal middle-aged woman does not want a frog prince. She wants a talking frog. <laughs> and, and it is her daughter who uh, falls for the frog prince. And then she's afraid her daughter's going to get pregnant by a, a chauvinistic male, a naked chauvinistic male. And that, that book is Fair Peril. And there were several others like that where I, um, The Hex Witch of Seldom was a fantasy set in the Pennsylvania countryside with hex magic. I, I did quite a few books like that where I straddled the line before I finally crossed it. You, you said before that uh, when you won uh, your first and second Edgar Award for mystery writing that you didn't think you were writing mystery. Is that kind of how this happened, that you approached it from this different direction and that's why you ended up in mystery without thinking you were there yet? My, my, my life and my career on a whole have and been basically about falling backwards into things, yeah. Uh, I fell backwards into writing because of my own mental distress. Uh, I fell backwards into mystery because I told myself to write a, uh, write a novel for reluctant readers, which is not a good marketing idea. Uh, let's grow cattle for vegetarians. Let's make guns for pacifists. Let's write books for people who don't want to read. No, but I, the, the market was there. And in order to write that book for reluctant readers, I committed murder on the first page, but I did not consider that it was a mystery. I considered that it was a book about the grief process and that the emotionality involved would bring the readers in. And at first I didn't even solve the murder. Uh, editors and my daughter and my agent and other people urged me to solve the murder and I did not, I did not know how to solve the murder so I consulted my brother Ben who was a former policeman and he's the one who told me that it was the marijuana growers on the top of the mountain. I dedicated the book to him <laughs> and, then, and then it won an Edgar. And uh, once again, we're falling backwards into someplace unexpected. And then another book won an Edgar that I had simply intended as kind of a, uh, a problem solving book, you know, a, a problem novel. I hadn't really thought of it as a mystery. So after that, I began to seriously write mystery. And I did that mostly by writing short stories for Ellery Queens and Alfred Hitchcock's magazines. But then that petered out, and I didn't think of it again until Enola Holmes came along. So what stage of your life journey were you in when she appeared? What were you wrestling with and learning and doing when uh, Enola Holmes became your focus? Uh, second husband, midlife. Um, I was pretty much... Um, well, just just playing well, just uh, tootling right along on the top of my game. I, I had won those Edgars. I was uh, making a living. I was enjoying my life. I was horseback riding. I was fishing from a, a rowboat that I had bought for myself uh, and living at, at the side of a lake. And, and I had a lovely life and I still do. So, uh, I, no, I can't say that I wrote those out of any uh, mental distress place at all. But for some reason, uh, Enola, immediately I knew that she was alone. And I guess that threw me back to my childhood again. Well, there are certainly dark elements in that uh, part of the world in the time that you chose, uh, the Jack the Ripper era. But uh, there's, there's a very... <laughs> It, it, there's a brightness to the Enola books that 
that makes sense with what you're saying now, because there's there's a lot of strife, there's a lot of stress. But I, it's it's funny to say this because I I know zero about fashion. I know zero about a lot of women's area. But I loved the fact that throughout the books, I always knew in great detail what she was wearing in every moment, <laughs> and the reasons why she was wearing that and how she acquired these things and a lot of other generally um, women's domain elements. It just, even though I didn't understand a lot of it in a personal visceral way, it, it gave an authenticity to her in the world that was really important to me as I read it. I love that. It was terribly important what you wore. It, it showed your place in society. Everybody had something to cover their head. Uh, even if it was a beggar, they had a rag on top of their head. Uh, maybe not the street urchins, maybe not the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, no, they had their caps. You yeah, had they were also in short pants. <laughs> yeah, they, they, you had to have something on your head, and what you had on your head showed who you were in the beehive, in the in the hierarchy of things, and what. Uh, Enola does best, and, and what my first brightest idea was, is that she subverts the fashion dictates and bends them to her will. In other words, yes, she wears the damn corset, but she doesn't wear it as a corset. She wears it as armor, as defense, as storage. She puts, I, I myself was a uh, very skinny girl, so I knew how much area you had inside a fake bra. Oh, and, and in Enola's case, I could only imagine how much area she had inside a bustle in which to hide things and store things. And I had, uh, I had researched by using coloring books, uh, coloring books about Victorian fashion and realizing how many layers there were in there and how many places to hide a pocket. And I myself as a woman had at times worn precious things hung around my neck underneath my clothing in order to protect them. Uh, if I was at a conference, that's where the room key went around my neck under the bra. So uh, it, uh, the costuming, very much had to do with who the woman was and how well she could protect herself from the world and what uh, what resources, what hidden resources she had to draw upon and what she could uh, I, at one point in the in the novels, there's a place where Enola is almost trapped by Mycroft and she simply, jettisons her hat and everything and pulls a length of Indian print cotton out of her storage and wraps it around her head and becomes an instant bohemian. Uh, so the, the variety of costuming also led to a variety of disguise and a variety of deception. She could turn into a totally unnoticeable beggar woman flower vendor simply by uh, being dirty and forgetting her, forgetting her fancy, you know, putting away her fancy clothes and putting on other clothes. Yeah, I, I also loved how often her elaborate clothing got ruined because it was so much the, you know, climbing a tree scenario, right? I mean, she uh -huh. was out shimming across a roof or going down a gutter and, and ruining another set of clothes because she was so active and, and she knew what the priority was in any given moment. <laughs> it was a very, very good thing that her mother left her so much money. That was, yes. the wish, that was the wish fulfillment aspect of this book. I simply gave her almost unlimited money and then she could do what she did. Yes. <laughs> I, I have to say there was many times that uh, I wondered how you got so much research in, in terms of Victorian fashion and now I know coloring books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and paper doll books. And uh, I found that I could internalize the research best if I ran it through my hands 
I, I bought myself a gigantic set of expensive Prismacolor colored pencils and uh, colored my head off. And say I was doing a Victorian interior in one of my coloring books. What's that thing? Okay, I guess that's a coal hod, whatever a coal hod is. What color is it? I guess it's black. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the, the books themselves, by the time I, I got to actually writing the Enola Holmes books, I had internalized so much of the Victorian ambiance that I didn't have to think about it too much. It was just in there. Of course, the fact that I was raised by Victorians helped also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, we're coming up on uh, question and answer uh, in a moment, but I have one last uh, thing I wanted to hear you talk about, and that is um, how uh, age group as an audience factored into your, your journey as a writer, um, writing for adults, writing for young adults, writing for middle grade. How did you back into or dive into whatever age <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, I, I backed into that one too. I was writing all those fantasy novels and I assumed they were for adults, but it turns out that they were being read almost exclusively by teenage. Well, not exclusively, but a great many of my readers were teenagers and I was not aware of it. And in, in regard to the Enola Holmes books, I simply, they, they were meant as young adult books. When they were put in paperback, somebody stupid uh, put eight to 12 on the backs of them, probably because of the length, but they were never intended as children's novels. Uh, uh, the fact that children are able to read them is a tribute to the, uh, the ability of children to read in this day and age because the vocabulary in those books I've never written down to children, but the vocabulary in those books is definitely not for your average fifth grader. And uh, so I backed into mystery. I, I backed into the Enola Holmes books, which are meant for young adults are actually read largely by adults and enjoyed mostly, I think, by adults. Of course, that's the whole thing about YA. Nobody knows who's reading it. Half the readers are adults and the other half are 12-year-old girls. Oh, yeah. And and all the best young adult books are written not down to readers. They're just they're just written. <laughs> yeah. it's, it really comes down to theme and, and other elements like that. And, th and that's the phase of your life where all the important stuff is happening, where you're thinking about deity and... Uh, fate and uh, destiny and eventualities and uh, what's the world coming to and it, yeah. all the things that adults are at my I don't, I don't know about you but at my age i'm like i don't want to watch the news i don't so definitely uh, and all the emotions are so high as a as a teen and and whatnot but um we're at the end of our time let's uh, get to questions and answers i believe that uh yeah Hi. So, yeah. Uh, Shiv has raised their hand. I was just. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, it has been a wonderful conversation. And uh, Enola Holmes, you know, whether it's young adults, Elderly adults, I mean, a lot, lot of people have appreciated the movie. In fact, I didn't know about the book, but after I saw the movie, I Googled it, went back to what this book was about. And definitely it was a, you know, eye opener in the sense that, yes, there is a genre which is, you know, flourishing on that end. Uh, just a, a question to you would be, uh, suppose you're in Agatha Christie's shoes, or maybe uh, you're writing, you know, for one of her characters, maybe they are young adults, for example, Miss Marple, or maybe Poirot. So what, what would you, you know, what is your thought process on that? And can we expect something like Enola Holmes on, uh, you know, young Poirot, maybe a female version of Poirot, or maybe a male version of Miss Marple or something like that, you know, something crossed on. So kindly, you know, enlighten us. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I, I love Miss Marple. 
I'm presently reading a kind of uh, Miss Marple who is named Maud Silver and is not by Agatha Christie. And she's kind of wonderful too. Uh, I've never thought of doing a young Miss Marple. I, I don't think you can be Miss Marple until you're old. I can't. Very true. I, I've, uh, I haven't considered doing a young Hercule Poirot either. Uh, I know some people have done a young Sherlock. Um, I haven't read all the uh, other Sherlock books other than the canon. And I feel somewhat uh, remiss in that regard, but it just didn't cross my mind. I, I, I write what I'm writing and I try not to worry too much about what anybody else is writing. So I'm not up to date on all the adaptations of Sherlock Holmes. There should be, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. There should be adaptations of Agatha Christie, but I suspect maybe her copyright is still in effect and that that might right. be a dangerous place to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, right. We have another question that has come in. Thank you for a candid chat, very enlightening and inspiring. Mm -hmm. How much, uh, the question says that how much time do you spend approximately on creating one Enola adventure? One of the defense mechanisms I've come up with as a writer is not to watch the clock ever. I have no idea how much time I spend writing anything. Uh, I don't mark when I start. I don't take a note when I stop. I would estimate a period of maybe a year for research and a year for writing. That's just a rough estimate. Uh, of course, once you've done that much research, then you can get on with the writing, but the research continues and continues and continues. I just recently stumbled across something where I realized that all Victorian women had to have a full set of gloves, all Victorian upper class women had to have a full set of gloves extending from two buttons to four buttons to six buttons to eight buttons to 10 buttons all the way up to their, up their arm for evening wear because there was never supposed to be an inch of skin showing between the gloves and whatever they were wearing. And there is a language of gloves too that I was totally unaware of until last week. So it, it, it's an ongoing process. Uh, there, there may be more Enola Holmes books. It is taking me longer to write them these days. I used to write three to five pages a day. Now I write maybe three to five paragraphs. It's just, uh, the aging brain just doesn't function the way it used to, but I'll continue. I will carry on. It's too much fun not to. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we have another question. Uh, do you read fan fiction for reference while writing? It's a very popular genre these days. Could you say that again? Yeah. Um, so the question goes like, do you read fan fiction for reference when writing? No, I'm sorry. I don't read fan fiction at all. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it's seldom a writer finds success in such completely different genre, genres, but you have written award-winning novels in mystery, fantasy, and others. So how do you maintain momentum and remain inspired through the course of these uh, different styles of writing? Uh, there's an easy answer, which is I make a living, which means that when the checkbook begins to look bad, I begin to get inspired. And then there's the more difficult uh, answer of I'm interested in things. Uh, I go around during the daytime, uh, with my antennas out and my eyes fully bugged, uh, just, just looking for interesting things. And oddly, the things that interest me are not the same things that interest other people. I was raised 
from the age of 13 until I, I think it was, I was 25 before I left it, in the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is all about the Civil War. And I have had numerous editors tell me that I should write about the Civil War, that it is a very popular topic. And I just don't want to go there. So a lot of it has to do with what I'm excited about. I've always been very excited about horses. Typical American girl, always loved horses. And in uh, the Enola Holmes and the Black Barouche, I treated myself by putting in a very feisty horse, a horse who disrupts everything. All right, uh, so we have one more question. Um, your writing challenges class, patriarchal and other boundaries in Victorian England. As an American, were you perhaps also echoing boundaries in post-war America through Vietnam, civil rights, the feminist movement, etc.? I was in college uh, at the height of the Vietnam War era, at the height of the hippie movement, and I wore my hair long and I wore beads and I, I, I looked the part of a hippie, but I wasn't. I've always just been um, my own little misfit. Uh, I, I take interest in what's going on around me, but some of it I identify with and other, other aspects of current events I, I just don't identify with. Now, obviously, feminism is something I very, very, very much identify with. Anybody can tell that about me. Uh, protesting about other things, not so much. Uh, my, my husband will get absolutely vehement about uh, topics that don't is, interest me at all. So, oh well, opposites attract. All right, uh, we have another question, which says um, that, uh, what would be your advice to amateur writers? How do you normally get over writer's block? I don't do writer's block. Um, or, or maybe I do, but I, I don't worry about it because all you have to do really is wait. And uh, the elves, that's what I call the uh, creatures who, work in my unconscious and sort of uh, uh, throw the story up into my conscious brain. Uh, they'll work on it. Uh, one important thing is to work when you're asleep. In other words, when, when you're uh, going to sleep, be thinking about your story and let it become part of your dreaming process. And when you wake up in the morning, you will be more ready to write whatever it is that you're working on. Uh, another thing is to, when you're taking part in critiques, if people are, are reading your, your work and criticizing it or giving you suggestions or telling you the way it should be, to uh, create a, a point past which you will not be pushed. In other words, to know where you yourself just absolutely have to be yourself and cannot be pushed be beyond that limit. Otherwise, you end up with something that feels as if it's been written by a committee, and that's no good. You really do have to know who you are. And then, yes, there is wisdom to be offered by other people, but you must decide whether to take it or not. Right, right. Thank you, Nancy, for that. We have another question uh, which says, does poetry have the length and breadth and the freedom to narrate like fiction does? Again, I ask you to repeat. Does poetry have the length and the breadth as well as the freedom to narrate like fiction? Poetry and fiction, wow, that, okay. It's no wonder I didn't understand it first because those two things don't often go together. Um, I actually, I love poetry. I love to write poetry. And at times I have used my novels as a matrix into which to sneak poetry. And 
I have published a couple of books of poetry, uh, Music of Their Hooves and uh, Stardark Songs. But poetry and fiction to me feel like uh, two different playpens. Uh, poetry has enormous breadth. Look at what Walt Whitman did. But it's not, when somebody says to me they're writing a novel in verse, I just cringe. I'm sorry. And of course, poetry and verse are not the same thing. But uh, I think you got me. Whoever asked that question, I think you've got me. I think you, you have gone beyond my understanding. All right. Uh, so we'll wrap up with this last question. Um, as you mentioned that you have given freedom to Enola through the unlimited supply of money that she has access to. Was your motivation to give her freedom uh, come from your beliefs as a feminist or was it influenced by um, certain uh, facets of your personal experiences or personal life? How was that influenced? Honestly, that was pure sheer wish fulfillment. I just wanted her to have enough money to do whatever she wanted to do or needed to do. And ironically, the fact that I created Enola and the fact that a movie was made from her has now given me, for the first time in my life, enough money to do what I want to do, <laughs> which is just hilarious. It's also remarkably uh, appropriate that Enola Holmes was made into a movie through the efforts of a reader who was a teenager at the time, which is Millie Bobby Brown. Uh, she spearheaded the whole thing. It, was not, it did not come down from any Hollywood CEO. It, I wrote four kids and the movie was made by kids and it's I let's hear it for the kids right thank you thank you so much Nancy for patiently answering all our questions over to you Mita thank you thank you Nancy and Eric um, I think you delve very deep with each of your answers with a lot of crispness and it's been a learning for us and also a lot of fun to get a peep into your mind and to your creative juices and everything. And it's also very heartening to see that uh, though you did point out your age, I think you're, you're one of the youngest people around here. So <laughs> yeah, more power to you, Nancy. And thank you, Eric, to have handled the session so beautifully and you've held it together and uh, very tightly, in fact, with very, very, pointed questions which were in fact which led us to really be remain glued to our screens i wish we could have done this in person i really really wish that we'll go back to those days and times very soon and we'll have we'll actually meet each other uh, but with that i want to thank each one who's attending the session and who has uh, in spite of it being one of our main festivals today, they have taken out time to be with us. So I really appreciate that. But thank you once again, Nancy and Eric, for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you, Eric. Thank you, Nancy. I love talking to you. It's been great. I liked it. Great. I'm so glad, Nancy. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. And good, good day to the rest of you who are on the other side of the globe. <laughs>